What's up YouTube and welcome to my pickups video for the month of September 2019. Actually going to start off with an arcade update with some of the things I've been buying for my candy cabinets and some work I've done over the last month that I wanted to show. And then I'll move into the console game pickups. So the very first thing I want to show is I figured out how to fix the original fluorescent bulb in one of my Astro City cabinets. Uh, it needed a new starter which is this little accessory thing that kicks in to make this fluorescent bulb start. And that plus a new bulb was all it took to get this one up and running. So my new Astro City has a working marquee uh, with the original fluorescent bulb, which is pretty cool. Next up, I'm going to show you a new game in my collection. This is Pandora's Palace by Konami from 1984. A very not well-known <laughs> uh, platformer that is kind of like Donkey Kong in reverse is the best description I've read for it, and I think it's pretty accurate. Um, essentially, you have this Greek mythology theme. It is really, really fun and addicting to play. Um, your goal is to get from the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen, which, of course, is different than the objective in Donkey Kong. But overall, the uh, gameplay is very similar. It has some fun uh, bonus stages in it, and really a lot of fun. Great music as well. Although, for some reason, the sound in this board is not working. <laughs> and it was working when I bought it from the seller off an arcade board for him. So I actually need to get the sound working, but other than that, the board is um, working great. And it's been a lot of fun to play over the last month. So definitely, if you get a chance, check out this game. Um, and I'm going to move on to the next upgrade on my candy cabinets. As I have replaced all of the buttons, ball tops, and start buttons with new Sanwa parts. Um, some of the ones that I had on these originally were like cigarette burn from Japanese arcades. Um, some of the buttons were missing, mismatched, wrong colors, yada yada yada. They now have six buttons per player. Um, not all of them are wired, but at least they are there for starting points. And also everything matches and is the original colors as it should be. So very happy to do all that. It was actually a lot of work. Um, <laughs> what I did not know is that Japanese arcades apparently have problems with people stealing their buttons and joystick tops, and so they put Loctite on all of the seals. And after about uh, 25 years of that setting in, it was very hard to break it to get the old buttons out and the ball tops off. So, um, after a grueling afternoon, I now have the new buttons installed on this cabinet as well as my second cabinet. So, really the same thing here. Same matching colors. This one actually is, I think, wired for the six button or six players. Uh, this cabinet was set this way to start, so this one already had the six buttons in place, and I just replaced them. The other one I had to add buttons to make it work. Um, on this cabinet, not a new game. This is Gamshara. I've shown this game before. It's one of my favorite uh, gallery shooters for the system. Very cool game by Mitchell. And the marquee on this one, unfortunately, still does not work. This one takes a different bulb uh, than the new Astro City. This is the original Astro City, so I'm still working on that. I do have an LED bulb in place right now that I can turn on and off separately, uh, but ultimately I'd like to get the original fluorescent lighting working in here too. So that pretty much does it um, for the update on my two candy cabs. Again, this has kind of been my focus over the last month, a little bit less so on the console stuff. Uh, but I thought you guys would like to take a look at this and pause here for a moment for a transition and I'll show you what's going on with my console game pickups for the month. Alright, so next up I'll show you the console pickups for the month and what I can tell you is this was a very, very light month for me. But I did get some neat stuff. Uh, I was very heavily focused on Sega CD as well as some Japanese PS1 and uh, quirky titles this month. So that's really where I, I dug in a little bit more focus. Um, I do have some more Sega CD stuff actually in the mail uh, that I should be getting soon. So you'll probably see that continue over the next month. Some reason I got re-energized on that uh, console this month, both US and import games. So the first one of these is one that I just recently picked up. This is AX101. <laughs> uh, this is not a common title by any means for the system. And uh, in my opinion, probably should be worth a little bit more than it is. Um, this game only sells maybe once a month or so on eBay for a complete copy, so you definitely won't see this one out there too often. i um, always been curious about it. The thing that scared me about this game was that it was published by the company Absolute, which uh, pretty much put out absolute garbage. And what I found out is this game actually was not developed by them. It was developed by Micronet of Japan, which meant this actually was a Japanese title uh, that they just brought over. Now, that being said... <laughs> Micronet does not have a great reputation either, and some of their games were also released under their side label, Big Net, and they're not very good either, so <laughs> I didn't have very high hopes. 
Uh, but what I was afraid of is that this game was going to be like a flight sim type uh, space game, and I'm not into those at all. This actually is a rail shooter, and I do like those. So I know that's kind of a relic of the Sega CD uh, FMV era, is that you've got these shooters that you play on a video background, and they're uh, on rails, so you don't have a lot of freedom. Uh, but overall, I kind of like the genre, and I like games like Sylphid, and I like games like Res. Um, so I thought maybe there was a little bit of hope for this game. <laughs> That being said, it is um, playable, but not very. There's not a whole lot going on. Uh, it does have some very, very poorly voice acted cutscenes, and then the gameplay itself um, is just very limited as well as just very crude. Like, you have a very limited screen um, that you can play on, and then also there's just the graphics are pretty terrible, um, especially for a 1994 release on the Sega CD. Um, a lot of the late releases really stepped up the power of that system. This game was not taking advantage of the system power in any way, shape, or form, with the exception that it is a very seamless experience and that you go from gameplay to cutscene with very little loading times. Probably because of the very minimal graphics, it doesn't take a lot of system RAM to make it happen, uh, but overall this game does not push the system and I can't really recommend it unless you're just going for oddball second CD stuff or you like rail shooters kind of like I do. So. I'm happy I solved the mystery of this game. This is a game I was curious about. The title does not help whatsoever <laughs> in selling the game, and that's probably, again, why this didn't do very well. Uh, but if you're looking for a similar game on the system, I would definitely go with Sylphid over this. So, happy to get it in my collection, but not something I'm going to be playing a whole lot. Uh, the other game I'm very happy to get in my Sega CD collection was one I've been looking for for a long time. This is a game that I never, ever saw in the wild. I've only seen this at uh, a couple cons I've been to, and it's been really expensive and that is Fatal Fury Special. Uh, this was one of the later release games on the system. It was published by JVC, uh, just like Keo Flying Squadron was, and I think that's kind of an indicator of a low print run. It's just some of the late release JVC titles um, they didn't make a whole lot of. So this is obviously an SNK um, arcade game brought to the Sega CD, but very unusually this was developed by a European company called Funcom, who handled the port, and it doesn't really play right. <laughs> um, I can't say I've played a lot of Fatal Fury Special, but what I have played of the series, it seems just very off. Uh, they tried, for sure. They added, like, nine different levels of difficulty, and it does support the six-button pads. So, I mean, there's some good strides in the right direction, but overall this doesn't play that great. Um, they did keep the original artwork intact, uh, which is great. So at least they were trying again in that aspect. Uh, but this could definitely be better. I actually ended up finding this locally. Somehow one of my local stores got this in at a really good price, and I could not pass on it because um, I've really been wanting this game for quite some time, and I just never pulled the trigger on eBay, so I was happy I waited. Um, ultimately, I got a much better price just by waiting. That being said, it's probably not something I'm going to play a whole lot <laughs> either. So very unusual uh, poor to this game, and I kind of was hoping it would be better, uh, but oh well. It, it stands up, I guess, with most of your average 16-bit fighters. It's just nothing extra on top of that. Uh, the other game I got for Sega CD this month is for the Japanese Mega CD. So this was a game that did not come out in the U.S. Uh, this is part of the Ernest Evans trilogy. And if you're thinking to yourself, trilogy, I thought there was only two games in that series. There is actually this game, which is a Japanese exclusive. Uh, this is known as Annette Again, or Annette Futatabi, um, which I believe is the Japanese title. And it is about um, Annette, who was the star of the sequel to Ernest Evans, El, El Viento. So this is the third game in the series. But what is completely different about the first two games is that this one is strictly a beat-em-up. <laughs> it is not something I was expecting, especially from this developer Wolf Team, uh, that I don't think ever made any other beat-em-ups. Um, it kind of shows in their efforts in that uh, the gameplay in this is a little bit weak. Um, you could tell they were trying, but if you think about things like Fatal, uh, sorry, Final Fight CD coming out before this, uh, it was a little bit weak you know, by the time this was released. So I do like the characters. Uh, the cutscenes in this are actually extremely well done. Um, even not knowing Japanese, you get a strong sense of what's going on in the story, and it definitely does link um, to the Ernest Evans in the story as well. You see some appearances by him, even though he's not uh, directly in the game, or at least not the part I've played so far. Um, there also is just a lot of bugs in the gameplay, so like, you know, if you think about beat-em-ups, it always has the arrow that tells you to go to the right, if you have lingered on a screen too far. This game doesn't really do that, and some of the enemies don't even reset, it seems like, to the right frames that they should be on. So sometimes you're just walking aimlessly between side to side from a screen that has nothing on it, waiting for an enemy to appear. Um, so it's definitely not a flawless gameplay. Uh, that I was hoping for, but uh, I do like, you know, again, the, the series. I like the developer Wolf Team, so I'm willing to give it a little bit of a chance. 
maybe a little bit more than I would for <laughs> a series that I'm unfamiliar with. So probably will be playing this a little bit more in the coming months just to make sure that I'm not missing out on something great that happens later in the game. But overall, it's just a very average effort um, overall, I would say. Uh, I got one other game for a Sega system this month. This was just a surprise pickup at one of my local stores. Uh, they are a chain, and so they just tend to price games the same for the old cartridge systems, even if the game is complete, uh, because their system is just recognizing one barcode per game. So that is sometimes a huge benefit if you just land at the right time, at the right place, right time. Um, I ended up getting The Adventures of Batman and Robin complete in the box with all the inserts for the Sega Game Gear for like four bucks. <laughs> Uh, very happy to get this in the collection. I actually did not own even the cartridge of this, and I own it on other systems, so I'm not sure if this is unique to the Game Gear or if it is just like uh, a toned-down version of the Sega Genesis uh, version of the game or even the Sega CD version. So I haven't played it yet, but I'm looking forward to checking this out. Um, overall, this seems to be a pretty solid entry in the series as far as the other ones are concerned, so hopefully that'll ring true as well as this Game Gear version, uh, but definitely can't pass up cheap, complete Game Gear games. Um, at cartridge prices and hopefully there I'm wondering if there was more that was brought in at the same time and just for some reason this was the last one left you know you kind of wonder what you missed out on uh, but overall this was definitely a lucky find and probably if I'd gone you know later in the day it would have been gone so just happened to be in the right place right time uh, next up I'm gonna move over to Sony systems so that was all the Sega stuff I got this month and I'll show you some games I got for Sony systems um, for some reason I just got into just going into Japanese PS1 games that are going for very cheap on eBay that could be interesting and giving them a shot just because they're so cheap, why not even give it a, a see what happens. So these are by no, need, no means like well-known <laughs> internet talked about hidden gems for the systems, but I was just curious if there's anything else out there that can be bought for very little money that may be worth taking a look. Uh, this first game I had no idea existed. I just happened to find this on an eBay search when I was looking for something else and it somehow popped up in the results and I just instantly knew I had to get it. Um, I don't know the full Japanese title of this because it is unfortunately not on the spine. Um, a lot of the PS1 games have the US or sorry the English version of the title on the left spine. I think that's right. Um, this one does not. It has the Japanese on both sides of the spine. So unfortunately I can't read it, but I do know that it does have Greatest 70s as part of the title. And what this game is, is a racing sim uh, by a company named Epoch, and it was released at least a little bit before the original Gran Turismo, or about the same time. It was released in 97. Um, and this game has a very sim-heavy approach, just like Gran Turismo, but the cars in this are strictly Japanese cars from the 60s and 70s, uh, sports cars, Hondas, Toyotas, Nissans, Mitsubishis, uh, that are from that era. So it's very specific in its uh, interest group. And I can tell you, just being a huge car fan, uh, those cars interest me a lot. So things like Toyota 2000, or 2000 GTs, um, Honda S800s, you know, little <laughs> K-car type things that they had back then that they made little roadsters of, very fascinating um, to me, and I like reading about those. So to see a game that strictly focuses on those was definitely right up my alley. Uh, the other thing that when I looked this up online is I found out it has a lot of video of those cars uh, racing, that they took some game or some footage of the cars actually racing on a track, inserted that in the game just for extra sizzle reel footage. And what's really neat is they even have still shots of the owners of some of these classic cars that they invited to their uh, production set, I guess, on the track. Uh, to really interview them and I guess get ready for the the race day that they put on just to get the footage for the game So definitely a lot of love went into this title, you know for a very obscure uh, Interest group of <laughs> cars that this would appeal to and I just really applaud the effort uh, that being said I am playing it, uh, but it is very difficult uh, there is a lot of car customization and tweaking required, just like Gran Turismo. Um, it is definitely very sim-heavy, and also the menus are all in Japanese, and they are a little bit intense um, when it comes to part swapping. And it's some of the ways that you swap parts in this game are very, very particular. Like, you will buy uh, upgrade wheels for the front axle and rear axle separately on this <laughs> game, and I've never really seen a game with that kind of approach before, so... Uh, definitely not for uh, a beginner racing fan. Um, it's not very arcadey in nature, but just due to the nature of the cars featured in this, I am interested in it. And um, unfortunately, it doesn't support the DualShock analog control, but it does support the Nedgecon controller if you have one of those um, for some analog control. So, very interesting title. It comes in one of these like thick PS1 import cases that we didn't get over here. It's not quite a double disc, but um, they also shatter really easily. <laughs> so I was happy that this one was not cracked and it's in good shape. 
Uh, but this one can be got very cheap if you're interested in this kind of thing, and uh, definitely a surprise PS1 game that I didn't know was out there. Another game that I started reading up on uh, was from reading all those old issues of Game Fan that I picked up last month, and it was actually of the 3DO version of this game. Uh, we actually did get the 3DO version of this game in the U.S., and it was released as a game called Tripped. <laughs> And that just seemed a little bit weird to me as a puzzle game, a uh, Japanese-created uh, puzzle game for the system. So I read a little bit more into it. This was a late release on the US 3DO. It was developed by Kenji Ino, who developed D and um, Enemy Zero for the Sega Saturn. Um, and he had his own game production company called Warp. And this was actually a very early Warp-developed title uh, for the 3DO initially that got ported to the PS1 very early in its lifespan in Japan only. So we obviously didn't get this game here, um, but it does have a very quirky nature to it. There's almost like a demonic theme to the characters in it. Um, they're supposed to be like space aliens, I guess, but they're very, very unusual character designs. And I kind of got into it. The gameplay is um, almost a little bit like Puzzle Fighter in that the larger the gems or enemies that you create um, can really have a big reward in how you attack your enemies or your uh, player two or your, your friend. And um, overall, I think it's a colorful, fun puzzle game. I think this could have done very well here if they toned down a little bit of the weirdness. <laughs> um, I have no idea how well the U 3DO game uh, sold in the U.S. I would imagine not well. It came out very late in the system life. Uh, but this definitely is interesting. Um, as far as the Japanese title in this one, I've seen a lot of different vari variations of translation. And again, the spine is no help. It's all in Japanese on both sides. Um, so something like Mr. Furopan P... Astrobiology <laughs> is one of the versions I've seen, and then it obviously has like a true Japanese title that I can't remember the title because it's very long. Um, but if you do want to find this game, uh, you can even search for it by looking up Tripped, and you'll tend to find it um, through that. It is very cheap. Um, the other thing I can tell you is this was a very early PS1 release. If you look at the spine, it was uh, game number 32 ever put out for the original PlayStation. So very early in the system's life in 95. Um, and it doesn't even support the memory card. <laughs> so it is very basic and bare bones in nature, um, but it is pretty addictive, and I played it for a couple hours yesterday, um, and honestly didn't get bored with it. Um, very difficult, but definitely worth playing, and um, looking forward to trying this out with a friend, too, to see if we can get some battles going. So if you like quirky Japanese puzzle games, this one is definitely worth it, and uh, very cheap to get. Uh, next up is a game I didn't buy this month. This is a game <laughs> that I bought approximately 11 years ago and never took out of the shrink wrap. And I was going through uh, playing some games this weekend and just caught this on my shelf and said, oh my God, I have never opened that game. It is time to rip off the shrink wrap and play it. And that game is Thunder Force 6 for the Japanese PS2. Um, I don't know why I never played this game, to be honest, but uh, I was obviously a big fan of the earlier Thunder Force titles. Um, definitely Part 3 is my favorite in the series. I know a lot of people like Lightning Force better, but I am definitely a Part 3 kind of guy. Uh, this game is definitely calls back to some of the series touch marks. Um, the weapon swapping is actually very easy in this. You just use like the L1, uh, L1 and R1 triggers to flip between them. Um, so you can switch weapons on the fly very easily. Uh, the graphics are kind of a mixed bag. Like it has some nice effects in some places and then some other parts look really cheap. Um, the cutscenes and production value seem pretty high. Uh, definitely has a lot of interesting intro scenes and things like that. Um, the music is, I, I read a review that probably described it best. They said the music in this would be great for like a Darius game, uh, but for Thunder Force, it's really missing a lot of the heavy rocking um, guitars and things like that the series was known for. So the music's not bad. It just doesn't really seem to fit the series and uh, some of the callbacks in it. Um, they definitely were trying to like call out the legacy of Thunder Force. Like even the intro shows like some flashback scenes from all the other games in the series. Um, Technosoft, the developer of the Thunder Force series, didn't even exist by the time this game came out. Um, this was originally planned as a Dreamcast release, and then it got shelved whenever the developer went bankrupt. So somebody at Sega, I guess, um, found somebody to finish the game off, and um, ultimately Sega ended up putting this game out kind of late in the PS2 lifespan. You know, it was around 2008, 2009, I think this game came out. I think for just some reason I stopped. Uh, I bought it at my local import shop when it came out, but then I just never <laughs> got around to playing it. Maybe I had a bunch of other games to play at the time. Um, so that's why I'm talking about it today. I think it's worth taking a look. Um, doesn't go for a ton compared to some of the import PS2 shooters. So it's probably definitely worth, you know, taking a look if you can get it cheap. Um, obviously I devalued mine by about 30 or 40 bucks by ripping the shrink wrap off, but I don't care. It was worth it to actually play the game uh, versus having a sealed game sit on my shelf forever that I was never gonna play. So. Um, that's that. 
And I have one more game uh, to show this month, and this is a new release. I know I don't buy a lot of new releases. This is a game, uh, I gotta give a hat tip out to Crack Lotus. He tipped me off that this came out. I had no idea it is a GameStop retail exclusive. Um, I think there is one of those limited run type companies that's selling this online also, uh, which I didn't see the, the sale of that. Uh, so he tipped me off about the retail version of this and I had to go run and get it immediately <laughs> while I was out that day when he texted me and let me know that this is out there. And that is Metal Wolf Chaos XD for the PS4. Uh, this is an a, uh, original Xbox title that came out only in Japan that is amazing <laughs> with the storyline. Uh, basically it is giant it's poking a giant stick at the American democracy system and just our politics and everything. Uh, it's probably even more relevant now than when it was released back in 2004. <laughs> and uh, it's very it's very tongue-in-cheek, and uh, obviously I can see why this would have ruffled feathers back when it ori originally was released. Probably trying to keep it pretty low-key this time, even considering. Um, that being said, the cutscenes in this are, are great. Um, the English is very <laughs> um, questionable, <laughs> and... Uh, Overall, the story is you are the president of the United States in a mech suit trying to beat out the rival evil vice president in his mech suit um, who is trying to turn the United States and kill freedom. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is uh, not exactly the type of game I normally would be into. I'm not into really mech games that much, uh, but the story is so riveting and hilarious that I am hanging on to every word. Um, so I'm trying to power my way through this. It is it does get pretty technical, I will say that. Uh, but overall, it is it's very fun to play. It's very arcadey once you're actually in the stages. So definitely can recommend this. It is a thirty dollar release, so it won't break the budget. And I think this will be collectible in the future. Uh, the Japanese Xbox version has obviously held its value pretty well over the years um, because it was such a forbidden fruit. And uh, some developer, Devolver Digital, I guess, decided to put this out in the U.S. Um, years later in enhanced form for the PS4 and at GameStop only. <laughs> so very happy to get this, um, happy it exists, and it was a game I was always curious about, I'd heard a lot about it, uh, but now that I can play it without having to get a Japanese Xbox, uh, it was very, very cool. So that about does it. Um, like I said, not a whole lot of games this month, but I did have some cool pickups, things to add to the collection, and some arcade updates to share. Um, so hopefully you like this video, please take a moment, like, comment, subscribe, let me know what you think. And I will talk to you soon. Have a great day or night, wherever you are.